So let's, yeah, okay. So then let me start the recording to the main part of the talk. Free start. Okay, thanks. Next, we will um, talk about in more detail each, um, each one of these um, um, cases that we, um, um, that we pointed, uh, uh, that we outlined in the summary. We first start by uh, reviewing the original construction namely that of Taurus conformity theories. Then we will look at the first case of generalization, namely Taurus orbifolds. And there we first study their partition functions. However, it turns out, it turns out that uh, that's not all. Of course, one is interested in uh, studying more and more physical observables in, in the theory. And in this case, also there is beautiful structure underlying studying correlation functions. And this we will also study. And then, um, hopefully, the time permits, we'll go to the um, not so successful cases so far, namely sigma, uh, uh, K3 and Calabio sigma models and the rational conformity theories. The main part of my talk will be about the torus construction. This is where um, you know there is a positive result. There, there is a, um, a, um, a particular bulk, new bulk construction. Um, uh, and uh, the main part will be studying that, but I will also try to mention the reason that um, in the other case, in the other two cases, Eduardo does not hold. Okay, let us start with a review of the um, ensemble averages of toroidal conformal field theories. Let us start with the simplest possible case, conformal field theory of a single compact free boson. Um, here we consider a nonlinear sigma model. We uh, we have a map, a nonlinear map from our um, this is uh, the base space, the torus, or in the string theory language we know that as a world sheet, it's a torus, a map from this torus to the target space. The target space we have is a circle here. The bosonic fields x we have here take their values on the circle. And this is the action of our theory. R is the radius of the circle um, and uh, alpha prime uh, string length scale. And um, okay, this here we have a conformal field theory, and uh, this is a, a very nice example. We can solve this exactly, namely compute the full um, uh, partition function, which I have written here. Um, so the uh, partition function. Let me um, talk about the notations. Um, eta is a Dedekind eta function, which I have defined here, and it gives us the oscillator modes. And the summation part is the lattice part. So it's um, the momentum and winding modes of the uh, string, which takes its values um, on the target space. And these, um, uh, these are quantized momentum and winding modes take, take their values in, a, um, in an uh, even integral surf dual lattice also in our field is known as Narayan lattice. Um, these are, uh, these depend, this part, this sum part depend as we can see on the radius. This radius is nothing but the um, modulus, the modulus uh, of our theory. Why is that? Here we wrote down our conformal field theory. We have the radius of the circle and del x del bar x is the exactly marginal operator of our theory. So exactly marginal. So it's it's marginal. We perturb our theory uh, by this operator. We land in another conformal field theory exactly because it holds to all orders. And so every point uh, on this space, we call it conformal manifold, is associated with the conformal field theory. And it happens that here, our conformal, uh, our conformal manifold is only one dimension, or namely the right radius of the circle. The exactly, if we add some perturbative term here, it, it does nothing but changing the radius of the circle. So it just changes this radius. So this is our conformal manifold. I've written one to infinity because there is a duality as we inverse the radius, the T duality, which relates uh, the uh, region zero to one. So basically, this is a this is our moduli space in this case. Okay. Now, next. Um, oh, sorry. Here, I just mentioned I wrote down the partition function, but I, uh, for uh, we are also familiar uh, 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 with talking about partition function as a sum over states in the Hilbert space. This is just the usual notation for completeness. 
okay, now we have our uh, uh, conformal field theory, we have its uh, conformal manifold, its moduli space, our modulus, the radius of the torus. Now, associated with this conformal manifold, with the real line, we can define a metric. The natural choice is a zamalogic of metric, which is nothing but the two point function of the exactly marginal operator, del x del bar x. This defines a metric on our um, conformal manifold associated with this metric is a measure. We can define a measure. Now let us define what we mean by average. Okay, let's take our partition function, which we computed here in the previous slide, and we integrate over the moduli space. Here is the real line with respect to the measure associated with the natural metric of our moduli space. Now, okay, in this particular case, the volume is infinite. This is not uh, nice, but we'll, this was just uh, an example, easy example to motivate what, how we define things. Uh, we are interested in higher dimensions where things are finite and um, nicely defined. So let us move to um, higher dimensional tori. So here, we just generalize what we had in the previous case where our target space was a circle to the case where our target space is a C real C dimensional torus where we have uh, C free bosons. Again, uh, we can write our action generalized as such. G is uh, uh, um, G and B are our metric space time metric and B field. These are symmetric and anti-symmetric tensors, C times uh, uh, C um, um, symmetric and anti-symmetric tensors. These are now uh, what we have before as the radius of the circle was our only modulus. This is now the generalization. The, full, the whole uh, family of moduli is given by these parameters and the moduli space is of the following form, a symmetric space, it's a C squared dimensional symmetric space of this form. Uh, we also refer to it as an RI moduli space. And again, we can easily compute the partition function of the theory. Again, we have the oscillator mode and the sum, the summation over the even self-dual lattice which we can see here. I haven't written the details, but um, again, it's a generalization of what we had before. So Q again is um, e to the two pi i tau, tau being the, um, yes, uh, complex, uh, 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 the complex structure of the torus, of the torus and um, PL and PR are left and right moving momenta. Now, the bottom line is that, again, the average is defined in the same way. We compute the integral over this moduli space, the Narai moduli space, integral over the partition function with respect to the measure. The measure is now, of course, defined with respect to the um, uh, metric, the metric of metric of this manifold, which is, again, um, um, computed, again, the same thing from two-point function of exactly marginal operators. Okay, now the point is that, so this lattice part uh, 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 is also referred to as the sum part, the part which depends on the moduli, namely on G and B on this moduli space. This lattice part is also known as the ziegel narine theta function. This is a moduli dependent part. And the important point is that this function uh, satisfies the following differential equation where um, these are two different Laplacians. The one H is uh, referring to Laplacian over the uh, upper half plane um, uh, associated with our, with our world sheet. We have the torus, we have the modulus of the torus and the other uh, uh, Laplacian is Laplacian on the target space. Here, target space is our uh, Narayan moduli space. Again, one had a uh, one have a particular form. I haven't written here uh, one some expression. The important is, point is that this uh, differential equation is satisfied. Now the idea is to take uh, is to integrate this equation over the moduli space. This part is just um, an um, it's a total derivative. One integrates. One has to be careful with the values um, of the function. At the boundaries, taking all this into account, we find that now we have this particular differential equation only in terms of the Laplacian on the torus, on the world sheet, torus, and depends on, on the C, uh, 
the central charge or the number of the free bosons. This was studied in the 60s by Ziegel and is known as Ziegel whale formula. There is a particular solution to this one. Um, the important point is that there is a unique solution to this equation, which is of the following form. This is, um, so here we have one over eta. Eta was indeed only the uh, uh, oscillator dependent part of the full partition function. There is no uh, modulus dependent out of it. Okay, so we have eta of tau, but now we sum over all images of the of tau of the complex structure of the torus under the modular group, the symmetry group of upper half plane. We sum over all the images. This is called the modular sum. We take into account all images, modulo um, integers. The reason is that this is the t duality. T duality under t duality, eta picks up a phase, but we, but we also have eta bar, so these um, cancel out. So in the end, we have this particular modular sum over a full uh, a modular group modeled by uh, uh, T dualities, modeled by Z. The important point, the bottom line message is that this is what we get under this particular definition of averaging. And um, this does not depend, of course, as we see on any of the Narayan moduli, moduli of our um, target space. Uh, now, the important point is the bulk interpretation of this result. So here we have C free bosons. Yes, C, C number of free bosons associated. Um, so each free boson has a U1 symmetry. And so our, our theory has a U1 to the C global symmetry. In a bulk interpretation, um, this is associated with a gauge symmetry in the bulk. In particular, we have left moving and right moving in the uh, in our two dimensional conformal field theory this is associated with a u1c times u1c uh, gauge symmetry in the bulk and um, the bulk interpretation is that this quantity is a partition function of this particular abelian chain churn simon theory on the solid torus this was computed in the following work from last summer the partition function on the solid torus is just one over eta to the power, uh, absolute value to the power of two c. And now the sum, the modular sum, is interpreted as the sum over all hyperbolic three-dimensional manifolds, which are bounded by a two-dimensional torus. And uh, because our um, ball, uh, our um, boundary theory, we have a conformal field theory on a torus, so our bulk theory is. Um, one case of it is a solid torus, but we have to sum over all possible cases. We can consider different, uh, uh, um, different ways, for example, when the contractive cycle is the time one, this is the space line, and then uh, we just have linear combination of contractive cycles. So this, this modular sum just gives all possible three-dimensional manifolds, which admit hyperbolic metrics and have a torus uh, boundary. This is the interpretation. And this is why they call it uh, exotic the theory of gravity, because you have the chern simon theory defined on the solid torus, and now you couple it to topological gravity. This coupling exactly takes to in, into account all these, um, uh, this sum, this modular sum, sum over all possible um, uh, config, uh, all possible cases, all possible three-dimensional manifolds whose boundaries is a torus. Let us now summarize these findings, these discoveries. We have three quantities which, is, which are equal to each other. One is the average over partition function, which we calculated, or, or, or tried try to summarize at least how it's calculated. The other one is the modular sum of the absolute value squared of the uh, vacuum character. So we, we, uh, we discussed theory of C-free bosons. The, Symmetry, the, um, uh, it has a U1 to the C global symmetry. And um, the character, the vacuum character, which generates this, is 1 over eta, 1 over eta for each um, U1, and then 1 over eta to the C for our whole theory. So 1 over eta, and we have just the square value for left moving and right moving. So we have a modular sum over the vacuum character. This is known as the Poincare sum. Uh, and as we described in the previous slide, Another quantity is also some 
um, is uh, the contribution of the Church-Simons theory to the path integral summed over all hyperbolic three-dimensional geometries with genus one boundary. This is the main result, um, the main discovery of uh, interesting papers from previous year, and we are going to build up on that by considering various generalizations. So maybe I pause here before um, moving on in case there are questions, comments. Okay, let us now go to, um, uh, uh, let us now consider ensemble average of torus orbifolds. Let us define what we mean by the orbifold. Again, we start from our uh, baby example, sigma model on a circle. Uh, the theory has a Z2 discrete symmetry. We would like to uh, quotient by this Z2 symmetry. This is how we define it. This was our target space. This is our uh, target space circle. Now we send all the fields X to minus X. It is a reflection with respect to this dotted um, horizontal, um, um, horizontal line I've drawn here. Under this action, every point um, on the upper uh, part of the circle is mapped to the, to the corresponding point on the lower part. There are two points which are fixed under the action of this um, uh, group, we, namely zero and pi r. These are the so-called fixed points um, um, of this orbifold. And now there's a new structure. We have our original case, uh, original theory, original single model on the circle. However, uh, we have more. So previously we had fields, um, uh, our bosonic fields, which are periodic as we go around the spatial circle, but the new structure with orbifolds is that fields are periodic up to the action of this group. So here, namely, um, if we go around the spatial circle, the field is not mapped to itself, but to it minus itself, minus six. We go, er we go around another time to get to the original configuration. These are the so-called twisted sectors of the theory. If we had high, uh, other or, uh, uh, Zn, other higher val uh, values, integers three, four, six, here we would have some overall phases, but that's just a generalization. The important point is that the orbital theory has a richer structure because of the existence of these twisted sectors. And uh, these twisted sectors, um, we uh, introduce them by uh, introducing twist operators. These are operators which are exactly inserted at these fixed points and they impose these non-trivial boundary conditions. Um, in this case, going to minus uh, itself, coming back uh, twice. So these twist fields, the job is to impose such non-trivial um, boundary conditions. The rest is just, um, again, straightforward. One can compute the partition function. The interesting point is that now, uh, we have this Z2 symmetry, so uh, we um, uh, uh, we uh, throw out states which are not invariant, namely we project our space. So in the untwisted sector, this is what we get when we project out some states um, which are not invariant under the action of Z2. The important point is that, again, we consider the twisted sector and project out Z2 um, non-invariant states, here uh, is all the expression we have. Interestingly, this ZS1 is just, is just our original partition function uh, on the uh, circle. The rest, as we can see, is just uh, are just uh, ratios of eta functions over uh, eta function over theta functions, Jacobi theta functions. Uh, these also depend on tau. But the important point is there is no moduli dependence here in this part because these are not, these do not su survive the action of the orbital. Whatever. Uh, uh, moduli, Narai moduli, target space moduli in their, uh, uh, dependence is, is in the lattice sum, which is only present in this uh, first term, which already we uh, have from um, original computation. Okay, please. Sorry. Uh, in these infinite sums you showed two slides ago, presumably there's a condition on C for which they're well defined. Condition on? On C. C for the control charge. charge. They, they don't, I mean, for very small, small C. They're, 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 exactly. I mean. I, yes, yes. This has to be greater than two, exactly, um, because um, the, this, this quantity you compute, you find that it does not converge unless C is greater than two. Yeah. Now, does and this condition become one, better? Sorry. The, hmm? the question was, does the condition become any better for the orbifolds or is it the same? 
Uh, a good, it's the same. It's the same, not much changes. Because in the end, as we will see, um, for, for, for the orbifold, these come along for a ride. So the averaging problem that you have is, is indeed what you already have before. The same quantity under the integral, the same um, um, asymptotic behavior. So nothing changes with this Thanks. with this orbital. Thanks. S one S one is just some kind of to get a feeling. You're not really going to talk. It was about just that. a toy example. Sorry, I I, I think right. maybe I forgot to mention. It's just a toy example because we can see the circle, blah blah. But we consider tori with real dimension greater than two. Okay. Uh, now, as Sally said. Um, we consider uh, the partition function that we have, uh, again, generalized from torus to tori to have a well-defined partition function. The sum is, the sum converges, everything is well-defined. And this is the expression we have. Now we would like to take the average in, in the same way that we defined before. These parts, the one from twisted sector and this project, uh, pro, pro, uh, this part from projections, they do not depend on the modular and are modular. The only thing we have is what we have already before. And also the other point is that the case of Z2 is very special because as we remember our exact marginal operator is um, for circle is del x del bar, del, bar, del bar x. Now we generalize it. The idea is that it's still invariant under the Z2. So the, our modular space is the whole, again, the whole um, C squared dimensional Narayan modular space that we had before. Uh, the logic of measure on the Z2 branch of Narayan modular space is the same as the orbifolded branch. So basically, the computation just immediately follows. Uh, this term is already what we, um, uh, uh, um, the other two beautiful papers co uh, computed the average. So this is what we have um, as for the conformal field theory computation. But now we would like to understand the bulk interpretation. Before the bulk interpretation, we remember from the previous case, we said that we have three quantities which are equal. One was the average over partition function. The other one was the modular sum over vacuum character, um, um, absolute value squared. One finds that this does not hold anymore. And you know one might be a little bit puzzled about that, but let us look at the structure of the vacuum character. The characters of um, this orbital, TC mod Z2 orbital, there are four discrete representations and one continuous family. I have written them in detail, but it's just, it's not important. It's, uh, we just remember that this continuous family is, is, is the one which has all the information about moduli dependent, dependence on Narai moduli and our target space. The rest, comes, uh, we saw we have the orbifold projection and the twisted sector. And um, we can see uh, uh, this is, so this throwing out some states. So there is some non-trivial non operation to be done. And one finds that um, the um, um, characters of uh, this conformal field theory are of the following form. If we just take, took into account the vacuum character, namely the, um, uh, uh, the character, the, uh, uh, the generating function, which is shared by all points on this moduli space, this is not, um, um, this does not hold, this is not enough. Okay, in the previous case, um, this was the shared chiral algebra, okay, this vacuum character. So one might naively say that, okay, that's the same thing, let's go ahead. But the thing is that it, that's not the case anymore. The shared chiral algebra is much bigger because we have a richer structure. We need to take into, into account all these. And as one can see, um, so here I write down the partition function in terms of these characters, um, just what we had computed here, rewrite them. But the point is that the correct prescription turns out to be we sum over all moduli independent terms, namely all four discrete um, characters that we have here, um, and we find that the quantities are equal. The modular sum of over it gives exactly the same quantity as the average partition function. Okay, what is the bulk theory? What is the bulk interpretation? First, we know that in, in our holographic setup, scalar field X is dual to a pair of gauge fields, A and um, A tilde in the bulk. And in our chern simon theory, in the bulk, there is also a global Z2 symmetry. We uh, send, uh, 
in our boundary theory, x, uh, we act, we define the action of this a true symmetry by, by sending x to minus x in the bulk, this, uh, this, is, uh, this action sends a to minus a, and there is a global symmetry in the chern simon theory. So the natural prescription is just following uh, what we had, what we did in our conformity theory, namely, uh, let's gauge the Z2 symmetry in the bulk. Fine, one can do the computation of this particular, of computing partition function for this particular chern simon theory. And this is uh, uh, the result we get. This comes from taking into account projecting states because we would like to gauge and the Z2 symmetry, this is what we have. However, that's not all, there is more. We have introduced new structure, the orbital, and this has its, um, um, its um, counterpart in the bulk theory. There is additional structure in the bulk, namely vortices. Vortices are co-dimension two objects around which local fields are acted on by elements of the gauge group. What it means is that here I consider this vortex, it's a defect, it's a line defect here. And if when uh, the field, when we go around, the, the gauge field goes around this defect, A turns to minus A. This, um, this is exactly what we have for twist operators. Twist operators we define such that they impose the non-trivial boundary conditions. Defects, um, indeed tw uh, twist fields, on the boundary extend to vortices in the bulk. And we have the same action of sending uh, field, uh, gauge fields to, the, to negative in the presence of these vortices. One has to take into account vortex configurations in order to compute the full partition function of the bulk theory. And one does it in the presence of vortices, again, the projection part under the Z2 action, one finds that um, it, ha it, it has of this, uh, it has this, uh, it is of this following form, take into account everything, namely all possible configurations, the uh, total chern simon par uh, partition function on solid torus turns out to be of the following form. ST here uh, refers to solid torus, exactly the computation that we did. And um, this is indeed the character part that we computed just, um, here, the, uh, uh, the moduli independent character part. So it, as we expected, we see that also in the bulk theory computation. But now one has to do the sum, okay? Now one sums over all three-dimensional geometries with uh, torus as a boundary. And this gives indeed the Poincaré series. So the three, again, the three different quantities are equal, and this gives a natural generalization of the duality proposal for uh, average over partition function of the source or before being dual to chern simons theory um, on the solid torus gauged, the Z2 symmetry gauge, summation over all um, three-dimensional hyperbolic manifold with torus boundary. This is the punchline of this part. Now I just mentioned the generalization, but I won't go through the detail but the, um, um, because of the time. But the point is that one can, uh, I, I talked to you about Z2 case. One can consider other cases, in particular um, Z3, Z4, Z6. Now the point is that, as opposed to the previous case, um, this uh, not, uh, so uh, as opposed to the previous case, uh, the action of symmetry fixes uh, complex structures. Some of our uh, some of our moduli uh, are fixed under the action of Z. For example, for Z three, not all lattice, not all Narayan lattices have the symmetry. We need to fix particular choose particular cases which have this underlying symmetry. So this fixes for us some of the moduli, and we need to therefore integrate over the remaining um, uh, moduli. In this case, our complex structures is fixed. We have to average over the remaining, the Kähler uh, sublocus of the moduli space. But the idea is that the computation is uh, done in a very similar way. One has to consider the fact that now the, uh, the sublocus of moduli space is smaller, derive the corresponding differential equation and define average and et cetera. I won't go through the detail. The punchline is that the same conclusion um, also holds here, namely the three different quantities uh, average of the partition function of the orbifold conformity theory, 
the modular sum, Poincaré sum of the um, characters, not only the vacuum characters, but all the modular independent characters and the partition function of the chern simons theory in the presence of um, vortices, as we discussed before, they are equal. A question. So this was the main result of the, yeah, yes. What, what about n equals five? This we haven't considered. So this is not part of this uh, cryptographic or before. And um, this, this, uh, uh, it is interesting to try to do that. And of course, there are ways to construct that orbifold in a consistent way. Um, one expects that um, maybe um, a similar story goes. I haven't done it. It's an interesting question. Also, other orbifolds you can talk about. You know, non abelian ones. Um, um, you know, different. They're very asymmetric. They're very interesting cases. One can generalize this orbifold construction. Um, it's interesting to do that. This we have focused on maybe the first uh, um, non-trivial orbifolds. I don't have a sharp answer for you for you for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it comes from the Schenker paper where they classify these orbifolds, right? Um, the crystallographic orbifolds. Yes. So that's, yes, yes. I believe the reason why. You do. Yeah. That's right. That's uh, that's just for the crystallographic orbifolds we followed also. Yes. But in general, one can generalize this. In do you Other have way. any comments on asymmetric orbifolds? Maybe I should ask this later. Sorry, I don't want to talk. No, it's okay. It's cool. I no. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. I think to do that. Um, I. Um, I uh, I have not done it, and mm, uh, yeah, no, I don't have something interesting for you to say okay. I, because one has to really. It's a bit different, no realizing okay. the asymmetric or before. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, it's very, sorry. No, it's okay. It's good. Uh, sorry, may I ask a question, please? Please, please. Uh, yeah, I understand that the, at least in Maloney and Witten, the Chen Simon's partition function is computed in perturbation theory around a particular uh, solution, classical solution. So I just am curious which classical solution you're doing perturbation theory about in this scenario. This is the same. This is similar. This is very similar construction. Okay. We, we just gauge a global um, Z2 symmetry that uh, this Chen Simon's theory has. So everything about that computation, nothing is done from scratch. It's, um, it's just the same computation that they have, but now take into account fixing this, um, this symmetry, doing, namely it gives you projecting out um, some states, you take into account this projection operator and then adding the vortex structure mm -hmm. to the partition function. But uh, the, the classical solution, the starting point is the same as already was, as you mentioned, uh, Maloney and Witten um, works uh, done a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so next, we are going to consider correlation function. So if there are other points or comments, questions about partition function, maybe we can discuss. Or... Okay. Uh, so how am I doing? Oops, I think not much time left, no? Oh, I think you have like uh, 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes, good. So the main, the main goal is to go through is correlation function uh, and go travel to Narnia. As I said, for K3 and uh, parts which the result is mainly negative, maybe I can uh, add later, you know, if there were questions, but the main goal is to uh, focus on this. Let's see how it goes. Okay, now, we looked at partition functions. Um, however, especially in a holographic set setup, we are interested in uh, uh, studying other physical observables, in particular correlation functions, not only the kinematics, but also all the dynamics uh, information of, of our theory. So in the previous case, namely original construction, the torus construction, um, the, uh, when we consider correlation functions, 
the, cor the correspondence is trivial because the correlation functions of U1 currents do not uh, depend on the moduli. In the bulk, we have a pure chern simons theory and uh, the currents do not depend on the um, on Narai moduli. We have, we do have a particular computation on the, the boundary side of, uh, of the U1 currents on the bulk side, but this is not moduli dependent. And on the boundary side, of course, we have all, all the operators which depend on um, momenta and windings, but there are no um, uh, localized operators in the bulk which correspond to them. That's the interesting, that's the part which we are interested in because they involve somehow um, the target space, namely Narai moduli. That's what we would like because we would like to take an average over them. So the original case is not interesting in this, um, as, uh, from this aspect. However, in the orbital construction, we have introduced but some new um, some new structure, namely the twisted sectors and twist fields, the, uh, the the twist operators, these operators which are inserted at the fixed points and impose these non-trivial boundary conditions. So one might ask, okay, um, is there any um, interesting thing? Is there any interesting for us here? Is moduli dependent? quantity which we can study. So this is the question we asked. What is the holographic dual of averages of correlation functions of twist operators in the orbifold um, torus conformity theory? This is what we would like to consider. We remember the baby example of a circle. We had two fixed points, zero and pi up. We generalize to a serial dimensional torus. We have two to the c fixed point. Let us label them by this vector, um, a vector which belongs to this space at two to the power of c. Let us consider this correlation function. Um, again, we consider z2 the simplest case. I will mainly talk about the two case, only briefly mention generalization in, uh, in the end. That's the, just a simple example. The other ones follow. Um, similarly. In the Z2 case, we only have one type of uh, twist operator, these operators which impose this only non-trivial boundary conditions, name, condition, namely a field going to minus itself. So let's consider a four-point function of, namely a correlation function of four insertion of these fields on the uh, sphere, on the two sphere. It turns out that um, these fixed points must satisfy this constraint. This is like a charge conservation. Let us fix one of them at zero. The other one are, are fixed as follows. This is the most general four-point function that we can write in our orbital conformity theory. Now, in this particular setup, Z2 orbital with four insertions on, um, of the twist operator on the circle. So each, each one of them, each um, uh, uh, insertion point um, is this um, uh, ramify point which imposes this non-trivial boundary condition. The idea is that we consider the covering surface, covering space of the sphere with four insertions at each point, which um, is the image of the twist insertion of, uh, is image of these fields, of these twist fields. It's, uh, there are two sheets meeting each other on the cover. So instead of a field going to minus itself, and again, coming back, so if we go on the covering surface, uh, when you go on this space, on the circle, when you go around a full circle on the cover, you go from the first sheet to the second sheet. You do it once more, go around circle on the base, you go back to the first sheet on the cover. This is what I mean by um, the covering surface. It turns out that in this case, the covering surface is a torus, okay? It's not in general. We go to other orbifolds, consider other uh, twist operators. You have covers of different um, 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 genera. In this case, there is a torus and there is this particular relation um, between our anharmonic ratio, cross ratio. So our four point function, we use the conformal invariance to fix three positions. We only have one remaining um, uh, parameter, namely the cross ratio. This is related to the um, complex parameter of the torus in this form. Fine. The tor the, this four-point function uh, has been computed in this beautiful work in um, in 80s. Um, we are only interested in the, in the result. The point is that the result depends on the cross ratio. There are these oscillated parts that we discussed before, but there's also this theta. This is a generalization of the 
Ziegel Narayan theta function that we have already studied before. I have just written, it's also very small. Um, it doesn't matter. It's just show that this is very much of the, it's just a generalization. We again have dependence on um, our moduli, namely uh, the metric, uh, the B fields. Uh, we have more, uh, all these uh, vectors um, which define our fixed point are there, but that's the same story. There is now the full dependence of Narayan moduli, so there is now room to take an average in the way we defined it. Fine, let us do that. I only mentioned the result of this computation. So here is the result. Um, first of all, um, we see that we have some over three terms. Okay, let us consider each term, first term. Here, we have this quantity. This is again, the same sum as what we have before. However, it turns out that now it's not over the full modular group. It's only over gamma two. It's a congruent subgroup of uh, the full modular group is of this form. Um, the reason why it's not the full modular group is that um, um, this quotient, the full modular group uh, by uh, gamma two, there are uh, six elements, oops, six elements, which change the position of these uh, points such that the correlation function changes. It's not the same anymore. There are, for example, there are, you may have configurations where you change to correlation function is still the same. And these exactly uh, contribute to gamma two, but there are cases where the co correlation function changes. That's why our group um, is not the full modular group, but fine. We can still define the corresponding Poincaré series, uh, uh, series associated um, now with this subgroup. Um, and three terms exactly takes to, into account three possible ways of pairing these four operators in the four-point function. Namely, it takes to account whatever was left under uh, uh, when we modeled by gamma two. Okay, so this takes in, in, into account all possible way of contracting these um, uh, of um, contracting these pairs um, together. And the other important point is the appearance of these delta functions. They have a meaning. Let us look at this here. In this term, for example, we have a delta function which fixes um, our fixed point vector to zero. What it means here is that. Um, this, this one on the left, this operator on the left, and this one on the right, as zero at infinity, must belong to the same fixed point. And as a result, the other two also belong to the fixed point. This is a very important consequence because of the bulk interpretation it has. Okay, we are going to discuss the bulk interpretation and uh, we remember this type of, um, this, this result. This was not, um, in, in the, or it, it, of course, this was not present in, um, the original four point function without average whatsoever, there is no such restriction. But here we have is under average, some things get canceled out and we have even more constraint are on how uh, different operators uh, uh, sit in fixed points, namely their endpoints have to be fixed pairwise, okay? Now let us look at the bulk interpret interpretation of this. So we already have discussed the fact that vortices are extension of twist operators on the boundary. So here we have a four point function. There are four vortices coming out and make two pairs depending on how, which term we choose and how we connect two twist operators. This is the bulk interpretation. We have four points where twist operators are inserted. Um, sorry, uh, twist operators inserted are pairwise connected by two vortices in the bulk. Two endpoints of each vortex is associated with the same Z2 fixed point. This is what is imposed by, by our um, averaging computation. Uh, the appearance of vortices in the bulk was observed in this paper um, um, a few years back. Um, um, that they anticipated this presence. Here we see a realization in our computation of averaging, we see a concrete realization of this vortex configurations. Now, we need to introduce another um, structure, namely rational tangles. Two tangle, 
first let us first define two tangle is an embedding of this joint union of two arcs into a um, three ball such that the end points of arcs land on four mark points on the boundary this is exactly the construction that we have here now rational two tangles are generated by acting um, with the monodromy group on the endpoints of the trivial tangle. Here on the left side, we have the trivial tangle. We have chosen this case where zero at infinity are connected, x and one are connected. This is a trivial uh, tangle. However, we have now um, the monodromy on the boundary. Namely, we can move around x, we can move x, the position, the, the only uh, um, parameter that we have in our conform field theory around other insertion points, zero, infinity, and one. This is the monodromy group that we have on the boundary. This should be related. We expect this should be related to the construction that we have in the bulk. In particular, here we have computed the average and we see that we have the sum over gamma two we, we are after the bulk interpretation of this modular sum omega over gamma two. So very naturally, we expect that this is related to this monodromy group under the boundary, how X moves around. And this is indeed what uh, one finds. Um, uh, we, as we discussed just at the beginning of this correlation function computation, we saw that uh, X, the cross ratio and um, the uh, complex parameter of the covering torus are related. We can take the inverse formula, uh, the, the inverse relation, and then find the, act, uh, the monodromy of x uh, as x goes to around zero and one. And indeed see that this group has, this monodromy group has two generators, which are indeed the same generators as, as that of gamma two. And the two groups are free, so they're isomorphic together. Indeed, as one expects, the, mon the monodromy on the boundary is, the gamma two, the uh, group, um, the subgroup of the modular group that we have in the bulk and gives us the instruction, the bulk instruction of how sum over all possible configuration in the bulk. Now, um, here I summarize. So this was our finding. This was the main formula for the correlation function. Now we understand each term and each coefficient um, sitting in front of each term. The sum over gamma two generates a set of rational two tangles, pairwisely connecting zero infinity and x and one. This is the, this is because this is the particular case that we considered here. Now, the remaining SLOC quotient um, gamma two exchanges these endpoints and generates vortex configuration connecting different pairs of four points. So we have now the full construction. Now there is a question. We only talked about rational tangles because we talked about how gamma two is the same as monodromy group and we introduced rational tangles, but one might ask, okay, why rational tangles? Where do they come from? In order to, um, to answer this question, we, uh, so, okay, what, what, what quantity we uh, compute in the bulk? In the bulk, we compute chern simon path, path integral by going to the double uh, branch cover of the Z to vortex configuration. And this is very similar to our, uh, to the procedure we had for the orbifold conformal field theory on the boundary. Now, the important, uh, the, uh, the important underlying thing is indeed the double branch cover of this Z2 vortex configuration. The reason is that the double branch cover of the trivial tangle is a solid torus. Okay, so, Chern's, so the chern salmon path integral just gives one over eta. Uh, absolute value to the power of 2c as we had before. This is a very important fact, and this is indeed this double cover of the vortex configuration, which is a solid torus. This solid torus world is the Narnia world. So let us do, uh, to motivate this Narnia, we look at this very short part of video um, by Thurston, where we learned about um, Good. Okay, when, uh, when we learn, uh, where one learns about um, uh, covers of uh, the uh, covers of all these um, vortex configurations. So I only play 
the first two minutes of the video. I want to take you through a little exercise of the imagination that will help understand and distinguish different kinds of knots. So we're going to begin with the most ordinary knot of all, the unknot. To be to two, occur to two, with the to two, and the dragons will come and they sound the drum at a minute or two to two today at a minute or two to two. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Here's a unknot in the form of a, um, a loop of tubing. But what you may not realize right away is that this tubing has magical properties. It creates a singularity in the fabric of the universe. And, and what it does is that as you, if you look through the tubing, the universe you see through the tubing gradually drifts away from the universe on this side of the tubing. And over many years, its properties and its occupants change a lot. That world through the tubing is called Narnia. Um, I can step through this magical loop, it's, it's like a doorway into another world, the world Narnia. Here we are in Narnia. We've been exploring, we've had lots of adventures and seen many unusual and interesting sights, but um, we've arrived finally back at the um, at this coil, this unknotted coil, and when we look through it again, we see Earth. I'm kind of tired of being in Narnia, so I'm going to step through the coil, and I'm back in Earth again. This tubing creates a two-way branching in the universe. When I go through it once, I I go from Earth to Narnia. If I go through it again, I go from Narnia back to Earth. I can keep going as many times as I want from Earth to Narnia. And it doesn't matter which direction I go through. I went from Earth to Narnia. Here I'm in Narnia and I can step back out and I'm in Earth again and so forth. This is the property of the tubing. But the tubing doesn't have to be just arranged as an ordinary kind of unknotted door, what happens if you knot the tubing? Will it create the same kind of split in the universe or will it create a different kind of split? Well, let's try and find out. Oops, sorry, no my. Sorry, I'm trying to. Oops. Problem sharing or? Yes. I have a problem sharing. At least I saw the first page. Oh. In a couple of seconds ago, yeah. You see that? Yeah, oh, okay, now it works, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry yeah. about yeah. that. Okay, excellent, sorry. So this was uh, just, uh, we just looked at the, um, if you would like, please look at the remaining of the video. This is just a motivation to the Narnia, namely for the uh, trivial tangle. So these tangles, as we remember, has this special property. Our gauge fields going around them is mapped to A to minus A. And again, going back, gets back to it. So there is this non-trivial structure there. And one considers the covering surface of this vortex configuration, which is the solid torus, the Narnia, that Thurston um, showed us. Now, the point is that all rational two tangles are homeomorphic to the trivial one. And so their double branch covers are also solid tori with modulus tau related to each other 
by the sum over gamma two, the same group uh, that we have been discussing, subgroup of the modular group. So here is the important point. Why here is the important point, the lesson that we learned um, by, uh, from this discussion is that there is, uh, there is this important lemma which says that the double branch cover over a two tangle is a solid torus if and only if the tangle is rational, okay? From our previous discussions, a three manifold bounded by a genus one surface admits a hyperbolic manifold if and only if it is a solid torus. This is why we are only interested in rational tangent conf configurations and other um, non-rational configurations, which could be there, but does not come from monodromy transformations of the endpoints in the boundary will not contribute to the bulk construction, to this particular bulk construction that we are studying because the uh, covering um, um, manifold of this structure is not a solid torus. This is not what we are looking after. Okay, so um, here I have just summarized the, um, pro uh, the proposal for the holographic correspondence for the correlation functions of um, our twist field, uh, our twist operators related to Chern Simon's theory on solid torus, um, some overall pos possible rational two tangle configurations. And as I mentioned, one can generalize to Zn orbifolds. Um, this is more complicated. However, um, again, we have that this four point function has a covering surface of genus now n minus one and two tangle is, a, is rational if and only if its n-fold cover um, is a genus n, n minus one handle body. It's similar, but um, um, there is more work. Um, uh, it gets more complicated for, uh, for, uh, for other uh, orbifolds, but the idea is that the correspondence can be generalized to, other, to these other crystallographic orbifolds as well. Um, okay, so now in view of time, maybe now I should, so maybe I wouldn't go through um, the, the, uh, the sigma model part. The, maybe I should, hmm? I think I'm over time, no? Uh, yeah, it's basically time, yeah. I mean, you could in principle stop for questions and if there are no questions, you could continue. Yeah, I just said in the previous talk, that, that's one option, yeah. Okay, good. So here I escape the case with K3 sigma model and let me end by uh, just bringing some questions which might be interesting to answer. We consider two dimensional theories and their three uh, dimensional bulk configurations. Now one can ask, um, okay, what about higher dimensions? Do we see ensemble averages and this new holographic setup in higher dimensions? This is an interesting question to ask. The other um, a point is regarding disconnected boundaries because now we have um, wormholes, presence of wormholes, and one learns about contribution to, uh, of wormholes to um, quantum gravity. And also, um, I didn't get a chance to talk about K3, but as I just mentioned at the beginning, the averaging over K3 moduli space does not work in the way that we have been talking about averaging so far. So an interesting um, question would be um, how one can define average over K3 modular space appropriately and as such consider average averages of um, interesting quantities such as partition function, correlation functions, twist gaps, and et cetera. This is mainly interesting because at generic points on the modular space of K3, we do not um, have any information about. We do not um, know what, what, what the conformity theory is. So if there is a well-defined average quantity, this might um, shed light on region, vast regions on this modular space um, about which we do not have much information. Okay, with this, I uh, stop. Thanks for your attention. Hey, thank you. Okay, now time for questions and comments. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, 
have you considered doing this for hygienists for single modular farms? No, we have not. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated. Sure. Um, he, you are referring to this part, no? Yeah, I mean, the, the entire arbipol construction, where instead of you starting with the Siegel Einstein series on SL2Z, you now have a Siegel Einstein series on, on a congruent level of SL2Z, you have Siegel Einstein series on um, SP. To these congress of group right we have not considered that um here already uh, you know at this mm -hmm. level the, the, there was some new structure we study but i think the original construction of the two papers that um from last year that we talked about they have considered such generalizations mm -hmm. yes to um higher genera mm -hmm. um the orbital generalization of that I, it's interesting, of course. Any in any direction, progress is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I should rephrase my question. I think like we, we we've been through your paper in quite detail. So I went like, are you consider going to consider it soon, or have you still not thought about it? But uh... oh uh, no, we are not at the moment. We are not considering that. No, we have thought about it. Um, Right. Um, yeah, we have thought about it. No, at the moment we are not studying that. Okay. Um, that's your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, other questions or comments? Uh, uh, I have another question. Uh, is it non-trivial to consider uh, like six-point correlation functions or eight-point correlation functions and consider like uh, more complicated tangles, for example? Right, um, good. So the first thing, of course, to do is four-point function. So it gets more complicated because um, even for this case, um, okay, uh, the procedure that we're taking, mapping the problem to the covering um, um, surface, uh, now that's a different, depending on how many insertions you have, you have a different different um, geometry on your covering space. One needs to go there, then generalize this computation. Um, so higher point correlation function in the same paper and also another uh, companion paper at the time, again, beautiful uh, computations have been done. It just gets more, gets more complicated, but uh, in practice one knows it's not a torus to cover, it's something else, but still one can, um, um, one can make progress. Uh, still one can write yet another generalized state of function for that. Um, you know, they, they discuss this um, uh, in quite some detail. You have different parameters now, but um, you can combine them somehow and write down your theta function. And again, try to do uh, an average. So, it can be done, I think. It might be a little more challenging, but the structure is there. On orbital conformity theories, uh, two dimension, there has been a lot of, of progress done since, um, you know, in these two papers and already in 80s. Um, so one can do such computation. And of course, also in the bulk, now you have more, now you have three tangle if you have, um, if you, uh, the, the next one, three, uh, Six point function, you have three tangles. So perhaps um, um, there is a beautiful mathematical um, studies uh, on that. Um, um, and one maybe tries to see how the picture on the conformity theory connects to the configuration of these, um, of these vortices. It's a, I think it's an interesting point to look at. Thank you. Okay, uh, further comments? Okay, then, uh, well, uh, then may maybe you attempted to go through cases very quickly or? Quickly, very quickly. Yeah, okay. go through in uh, three minutes or something like that. <laughs> very quickly. The point is that, 
um, okay, what happens to K3? Again, the quantities which computed average over partition function and the other one modular sum over character, some char vacuum character, let's take, and possible bulk interpretation. These are the three things we had in our original construction. So for K3, first of all, this left-hand side, we have no idea mm -hmm. at the generic point, there are particular points, for example, orbifold toroid or orbifold point, the Kumar surface or Gefner points. We don't know very well, but that will be very similar to already orbifolds we have been doing. The generic points, we do not know what the conformity theory is there. We cannot, uh, we do not, um, as such, we cannot write uh, associated differential equations, solve them, blah, blah. So we don't have any information about the left-hand side, but still what could ask, okay, still we know the K3 case is a supersymmetric conformity theory with N equals four comma four, small four comma four supersymmetry. And we know very well by this beautiful work, this series of beautiful works, we know what uh, vacuum characters are. Can we just um, take the modular sum over them? No, the, the, the first very naive maybe guess one has. Yes, of course, one can do that, but one finds that on the right-hand side, if one performs this um, computation, the spectrum is not positive definite, which is not so nice because on the left-hand side, okay, we don't know what it is, but it better be a very nice and well-defined conformal theory. And we would like to average, namely take an integral over the full family of these theories. Again, it better be that um, K3 sigma model and its average, the integral, be positive definite. So the fact that um, this operation on the right hand side is not a positive definite quantity is by itself, um, it shows that um, um, it's not correct. But we had our experience from orbital construction where we not only considered the vacuum character, but only, um, uh, but, but also added um, other moduli independent parts in order to get the correct answer. So the next naive guess would be, well, we have also now all our BPS characters, half BPS, the chiral ring, anti chiral ring, and quarter BPS. Um, these um, are counted by the elliptic genus. Let's take into account those as well. One does it, finds that unfortunately it's not still positive definite. So mm, this is what I mean, correspondent fa fails at this level. This is the very first um, attempt when my one might try to do. This is uh, the story with K3 and with minimal models. Now we have uh, just some points there. We do not have a, a moduli space, but if, if we consider unitary minimal models um, are identified by this pair of integers and we have uh, well-defined central charges. Now where P is greater or equal that, that, than five, we have two, or sometimes three um, unequal physical conformity theories at each central charge. And these, are, these correspond to A or D, and in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, E um, series modular invariants. So the idea would be that, okay, let's consider a particular central charge. There might be two or three uh, physical conformity theories. Can we now um, define and um, this average uh, duality as such, namely we have the vacuum character. Again, we perform the Poincaré sum, the modular sum, and we ask whether we can write it as a sum over partition functions of these two or three conformity theories with a positive weight. This, this is a way to define this um, ensemble average. We do not, we have just points. We add them with a positive weight. And it turns out that for, um, it works for that values of P greater than 14, it does not work. Um, also for West Domino with models are families um, of such theories. And recently there have been a lot of interesting work exploring again, in which cases one um, can define such, um, such um, a duality. And this, these, um, so the case with Orbifold and with K3 and rational uh, conformity theories motivates the following conjecture that the Poincaré sum of vacuum character of any chiral algebra with C greater than C critical does not have a positive definite spectrum. And C critical is defined as asymptotic density of states of the chiral algebra. It's like the number of currents that we have. We look at the asymptotic states. Um, so 
in the orbifold case, as well as the torus orbifold, C is indeed equal to uh, number of the carats. We have the Sugawara construction there, for example, for the torus orbifold. But for K3, for Calabiaus, um, this is not the case. For rational cosmology theories, this is uh, equality. C is indeed C, uh, uh, equal to C critical. So this is um, what uh, this is the conjecture for um, the um, the requirement that um, uh, uh, that uh, C should be equal to C critical. If C is greater than C critical, we do not have a positive spectrum. Okay, that's the okay, main part. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So it's basically time, but if somebody has a short question, we can take it. Well, okay, then, then I have a short question. So for K3 case, there is still a possibility that if you change the seed, like uh, if you change some, start with some combination, take a one car series, it might work, right? So. True. Yes, that's exactly. That's. Um, Probably there are not that much candidates. So how is the exhaustive? Have you ex explored or? This we have not explored. Uh -huh. um, in other case, you have a bulk interpretation in your mind. No, but, um, I it's risk clear. Yeah, I see. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, then let's uh, thank Ida again. So, Ida, are you going to be at the Gadotan discussion today, or? Yes. Okay. So, if you have more questions, you can always um, create an avatar and try and uh, figure out there. That, that's great. So, uh, so yeah. yeah. Okay. The speaker is my come to this Gadotan discussion, and the schedule afterwards is that we are going to take a third, uh, I think, uh, like a forty minutes, approximately forty minutes break. And we will convene at uh, 9 p.m. Uh, in Japan time. But in any case, in whatever time zone, you will start at 40 minutes. And there is a final talk today by Ed Witten, um, somewhat related to, I think it's uh, explaining the, uh, the thing uh, Edward Frankel was discussing uh, earlier today. So uh, please try to do, try to come back. And then afterwards, we are going to have some uh, 